welcome. I'm Astrid Druni. I'm a lecturing fellow in the English department who works in 17th century literature. And Hello, I am Sarah Conrad. I am an undergraduate student currently. I am in my second year of my program and I am studying history and computer science. And I served as Dr. Jeannie's research assistant on this project for the past year and a half now. Yes, wonderful. Um, so we're here to talk about um, a project that has started um, for the past year um, called Early Modern London. And I would like to start by thanking the Center for Computational Thinking here at Duke University for supporting this work and for hosting today's event. Well, only one of the students, Sarah, is present for today's talk. Um, I also want to thank all the other undergraduate participants for this project for the excellent work that they have produced um, this year. And in particular, I want to give uh, a special thank you to Emily Geffard, the graduate assistant who has been working tirelessly behind the scenes to make all of this work. Um, so first of all, uh, just so you know what we're planning to do today, um, I'm gonna start by giving a bit of background on the project, how it started, um, what is the theoretical is qu historical questions that we aim to answer. And then Sarah and I will go into some of the details uh, and the key results of the project and the methodology that the group employed throughout this year. Um, I do want to warn that the project is still ongoing and the students are still working hard to produce a website that will be up and public by the end of the term. So some of the results are still a little bit rough in the edges, uh, but they'll get there by May. In addition, I would also like to say that while this specific topic, early modern London and the printing industry in this period, is um, tailored for this project, um, the overall methodologies and time period of research has been really developed over several years um, using methodologies that have been supported by Data Plus, the Information Initiative at Duke, and Bass Connections. So I want to emphasize that I would not have been able to train and dis direct this fantastic group of students if I not had received the support from across Duke University. So we'll start by giving a little bit of a sense of the project at the beginning and its goals. Um, so the goal of the project was to help students um, learn how to use a variety of computational methods to attempt to reconstruct with some granularity the lively printing and publishing world of early modern London. In my regular classes, I teach primarily 16th and 17th century literature. And I have to say that one of the challenges in teaching, for example, a set of plays by Shakespeare or Ben Jonson, is to communicate effectively to students that these authors did not work in isolation, but that they were members of an active and competitive commercial community, ranging from the authors themselves, to the printers, to the booksellers, and finally, to the audience of their works. At each step of the commercial chain, personal and professional relationships help to shape the production and market for the author's works. So what I really wanted to do with this project was to explore ways to make this historical context much more alive to undergraduate students, while at the same time experiment with ways to include computational methodologies in undergraduate humanities education. The existence of ready-to-use tools for social network visualization and analysis, such as Gephi, and as well as powerful packages in R and Python, created the opportunity to do work hand-in-hand -hand with a small group of students, um, researchers, to attempt to study these li literary networks. And I'm actually sorry that I sort of tripped over a small group of students because um, I was thinking that I would work with three or four students um, for the course of the year, it turned out to be a group of over nine students. So some people moved in and out of the project over the year. Um, so I was really delighted to find um, so much interest in this approach. Uh, finally, uh, one of the pedagogical benefits that this project demonstrated for me is that students started to visualize the specific details of at least a slice of life in 17th century London. Places mentioned in plays or other literary works um, 
really became, I think, much more alive and concrete rather than being something abstract mentioned here or there. So um, why London and why printing networks out of all the other possible topics in early modern literature? Well, um, to an early modern visitor of London, London, what would have stood out was the commercial activity of the city and its dense population, which at the turn of the 17th century included around 200,000 period people. In this period, London was by far the largest and most popular city in London. And in all of Europe, it was only second to Paris and Naples. Um, and it was growing at a rapid pace. Um, these demographic and economic trends mean that London's literary and publishing more general productions had a substantial audience. So even though the actual number of people involved in the production of this work was not particularly large, um, we, had, we had different times in the first half of the 1600s, 27 to 30 printing presses active at any given time, um, the audience uh, was large by contemporary standards and eager for new works. So um, to make sense of what I will talk about as we get in details of this uh, market and industry, um, I will need to give a few key definitions about the book trade in England in the early modern period. So please bear be with me. I will keep the definitions uh, at a basic level for the sake of brevity. <laughs> Um, but I promise they're important. Um, so first of all, what you see right now on your screen is a page from a work from 1618, and it's the title page. And this is sort of one of the things that we worked extensively with this uh, project. Um, so let's look at some of the information that we could get out of this work. Of course, the title. Um, potentially the author, though here it's somebody who's anonymous, is using a made up name, um, we know from historical research that it was probably the playwright Thomas Middleton or potentially the playwright Thomas Decker. Um, but we can find out the publisher. So by looking at the bottom of the uh, title page, you can see that it was printed by E.G. for Lawrence Lyle. Um, now, Lawrence Lyle is a publisher in the early modern sense, which is a little bit different from the 21st century sense. Uh, so a publisher is somebody who bought the original um, text of a work for printing, so would go and buy the manuscript. Um, they were also the person who had to deal most directly with clearing a text for publication with the mechanisms of preprint censorship. Um, so the publisher would have to take the book to be approved by either the Bishop of London or the Archbishop of Canterbury, pay a fee for that, and in addition, the text had to be registered and licensed with the Stationers Company of London. And I will have more to, talk, to say about them um, a little bit later. They would also pay a fee for that. Um, and then they would pay a printer to produce the copies of the work. And the publisher would then often sell the book wholesale. So here we see a location, again, printed by E.G. for Lawrence Lyle, and are to be sold at his shop, meaning Lawrence Lyle's shop, in Paul's churchyard at the figure of the tiger's head. So that's where the wholesale retelling of the um, items would be. The printer, in this case, E.G., who was probably Edward Griffin. Um, these were the people who owned the physical printing press and the type. Um, they didn't necessarily sell books, though sometimes a publisher could also be a printer. Um, and they were, so, as printers, mainly identified as the people who would produce the physical books. Um, and sometimes I'll mention booksellers proper, and these are sort of the retail day-to-day um, -day sellers um, proper. All right. Now that we have this terminology out of the way, um, let's see what we can do with early modern books um, in a way that makes sense for computational analysis. Um, the first thing that I want to say is that we are very lucky to have a number of surviving records from London's printing trade. Um, 
And these are the records, and we're going to use three digitized databases um, that form the basis of this project. Um, I will start by describing the databases that were used for the project, and then we'll get into the details of data cleaning and the project itself. Um, so first of all, and this is the database that Sarah, along with Henry Gusses, um, worked with starting in the spring of 2022. Um, we started with the stationer's register online. So uh, first of all, this is the register of the stationer's company of London. Uh, and it has records from 1557 to 1640 of all printed books in London. Um, the stationer's company itself controlled the publishing industry in early modern London, and its register preserves the records of which publisher acquired which titles for publication in any given year, as well as details such as fees paid to the company for publication, um, fines if a member of the company broke some bylaw of the company, and which member of the company, which officer of the company itself, entered the record of the publication in the register itself. Um, with this data, the project at its, at its very inception, um, as we started off, aimed to begin to reconstruct the relationships of specific slices of the printing world of London. Um, we're lucky to have a copy survived from the 17th century, and we're lo also lucky to have a digitized version. And if you look at the image on your screen, you can see the sort of portal to the stationer's register online. Um, as you can see, it's one entry here from the 3rd of January, 1606. Um, the publisher is Nathaniel Potter. Uh, you can see the entry transcribed from the original register, and then you can see a few other bits of information. As I said, the fee, for this case, six pence, um, and then the master and the wardens of the company itself at the end. On the other half of the screen, what you'll notice is what was actually crucial for our work, which is the XML version um, of the, um, the register entry. So the, what you see on um, the right-hand side of the screen, it's the exact same entry as what you see on the left-hand side of the screen, but in a way that we could actually import into um, our tools. So uh, this was one of three databases that we used, um, and sort of the first one. The problem with this database, and the reason why we moved on to the others to supplement it, is that oftentimes the entries are very short and leave out some details. They might talk about Nathaniel Butter acquiring a number of works without specifying every single title or author. So it's hard to get some of the granular details that we really wanted to have for the project. So to supplement this information, um, we went to a ProQuest database uh, called Early English Books Online, and I'll be referring to it as EBO. Um, EBO is actually a mid-20th century database originally. It used to be in microfilm and microfiche. So what you see on your screen here is a scan of an original microfilm image of a title page of a work. Um, obviously, this has been digitized, and I know that the images are small. I tried to cram everything on one slide. But what you can find online, um, which is fully searchable, is copies of the images of the microfiche, which have been cleaned, made much easier to read. Um, but also, for a subset of this text, um, a fully transcribed by hand version of the work done by the Text Creation Partnership. So sometimes we refer to just EBO TCP. Um, so some of the major points, and sorry, um, finally below here, you will see the XML version again of the text. Um, but some of the major points about EBO as a database and why it's so useful for us. Um, well, first of all, the high quality scans themselves, which cover works in English from 1475 to about 1700. 
And the fact that starting in the year 2000, as I mentioned, the Text Creation Partnership digitized and transcribed um, about 60,000 XML encoded text and added a clear way of extracting important metadata. And so I'll mention what we have been using from the database, but there is a wealth of information that can be pulled out of eBOTCP. Um, the title of the work, of course, the author if known, publisher, printer, date, and location of publication, and further classification such as genre um, and further information sometimes about the author. Now, uh, the tricky part is the question of location of uh, publication or wholesale location. Um, I'm going to just go quickly back uh, to the previous slide, um, a couple of slides up, sorry. Um, as I mentioned here, you can find the location for wholesale of the publisher's um, shop advertised on the title page of the work but not in any way that would refer to uh, easily findable locations in modern London. We don't have addresses in the way we understand them in 17th century London. Um, so for instance, this is a particularly nice entry is Paul's Churchyard at the sign of the tiger's head. Now Paul's Churchyard is St. Paul's and the churchyard is just the outside. Um, and that is still a visible existing landmark in London today. Uh, we're not always that lucky when we look at uh, 17th century locations. So what we had to do is to use our sort of ter third data set, uh, which is a 1561 um, map of London known as the Agus map, um, though this is due to a spurious uh, attribution. Um, to the, um, sorry, um, a spurious attribution to the surveyors, Ralph Agus. Um, we don't actually have the name of the surveyor who produced the map, um, but it is a map from 1561, which shows uh, locations of building, uh, the walls of London streets, bridges, and in particular, um, its digitized version, um, which you can see on the screen right now, allows you to locate specific buildings. Um, here it's um, in the middle in purple, we see St. Paul's, or even smaller features such as in orange on the current version that you see on the screen, um, two gates. And this can be important because sometimes the only information will be across from a gate. Uh, for the location of a publisher. I think, Sarah, you've had quite a bit of trouble. Yes, quite a few tr quite a few troubles with the city gates is they're not exactly specific. It can refer to multiple locations sometimes, and there's no indication of where they're walking from. So, yeah, so not the easiest. <laughs> sometimes students would have to go and just try to look through contemporaneous information to see, um, did they really mean the gate or like a block away from the gate? Um, so um, this was really... Uh, helpful in trying to get as close as possible. And so I, I just want to give uh, a lot of credit to um, the setting up of this graphical user interface that allows us to highlight at least some major locations in London. So as you can see, um, the students had to work with a, an incredibly rich amount of data across three different databases, but this is also means that they had to find ways to coordinate between three different types of information that was encoded in different ways. And even in their digitized modern versions, these data sets were created with very different purposes in mind, which didn't match our needs necessarily. <laughs> um, so they had to find ways of cross-references that sort of made sense of these differences. Um, so what I want to point out that a lot of the work that the students did at first, especially during the spring and the beginning of fall semester 2022, um, was really about taming the data and organizing it in a useful way. And I want to also say that um, useful um, really changed as we went through the project and found out limitations of certain approaches and tools so that they had to go back and rethink. 
So what I'm going to do is actually bring up some of the um, examples of extensive um, data organizations, um, a lot of spreadsheets um, that the students did. So just starting with information about um, a title of a work, a partnership between publisher and printer, sometimes a couple of um, publishers, um, in any additional information from works, um, students started organizing through a series of shared spreadsheets um, where they started coming up with conventions for resolving inconsistency. So if a work was entered with one particular title in the stationer's um, registry, but a different one for publication, and it was a play, um, what sort of decisions could we make about should we use the title as it was possibly performed or the title as it was printed? Um, which direction should um, our data collection go? And so, um, by the way, before I move on uh, to discuss the next step of the project, I will say that I will not be able to cover all the work that these amazing students did, um, but I just was constantly impressed by their determination to keep uh, sort of organizing this data. So I'm going to give you two quick examples, um, and I'm going to focus on some of the different types of data organizations that we had to do for different methodologies and goals. So what you see on this uh, slide, and I'll give you details view in just a second, um, it's essentially two different spreadsheets um, based for two different subgroups in the project. As students uh, started digging further into the data, I think pretty naturally, but based on interest, you guys started breaking up in different subgroups, right? Mm -hmm. It wasn't forced, I think. No, it wasn't. I think it occurred pretty naturally as we noticed that there was always going to be people looking at the social network itself in terms of who knew who based off of who was publishing with who and who was printing with who, whereas the actual physical location was going to involve some more ArcGIS work and um, other forms of geographic attribution. And then there was, of course, the text itself of the plays we were working with, which sort of went more to sentiment analysis or looking at ways in which words are used and in what contexts. Yeah, so I think you know, students' own background, sort of interest in terms of computational methodology, as well as the history dictated who worked with whom uh, in the group. Um, so uh, the examples that I'll have, one is around text analysis, and I managed to convince some of the sermons to work with some of my favorite texts, meaning um, some of the students to work with some of my favorite texts, sermons, um, which was uh, really impressive of them. And the second one example that I will give, it's actually uh, focusing in on a particularly interesting publisher and sort of um, the kind of, in terms of genre of works that this publisher worked with and the authors that he collaborated with. Um, so here's example one. So this is a screenshot from the first part of a spreadsheet. Um, and so what it's going to show is um, a collection of sermons in the first half of the 17th century that discuss the term charity. And um, the students who were working with this text, had to, with this set of texts, had to organize it systematically uh, with information about author, publisher, printer, title, date, location, um, ID, the ID refers to the original identification of a file in EBO TCP. And they had to find a consistent and standard by standardized way to do, do so, even though the original works themselves um, are extremely not standardized. As you can see, some of, maybe you can't, it's quite small, I'm sorry about that. Some of the, um, information only, some of the titles only tell us that they were published in London, while others will give a little bit more of a location detail. And because these are sermons, um, and also plays will do the same thing, some of them will mention where the sermon was delivered or the play was performed originally, so we have an extra layer of inform location information. So if we're trying to find out 
what the hub of printing and the hub of literary production was in London, we had to make some decisions um, as a team about are we going to include um, sort of the performance or the delivery uh, locations or just the selling and publishing location. Um, for the next one, which was for network analysis, and Sarah, once I finally stop speaking, we'll give you some details about that, is focusing on Oaks, um, whose last name you see two different spelling. This is pretty common from the period. Um, who's one of the center publishers in our period. Um, and Oaks here stands for Nikos Oaks, but he's also the father of another publisher, John Oaks. Um, so sometimes we would be able to tell the dif difference between the two. Um, you would have a uh, publisher being Nicholas Oaks or John Oaks or Nicholas and John Oaks. Sometimes we would just get the last name and we had to guess or do our best to figure out based on um, the time period of the publication, whether it was the father or the son uh, involved with that particular title. Um, and sometimes they would be paired with a longtime partner, um, John Norton, also a member of the Stationers Company of London. Um, so I bring up Oaks as one of our main examples because um, he was one of the key publisher of some of the most important um, poets and playwrights in London in the period. He worked with Shakespeare, um, Ben Jonson, Middleton, and Decker. Um, so having somebody who is such a key figure um, as a starting point for an analysis of a network of publishers and printers in the period, um, we thought would be a good way to start diving into um, sort of the commercial and personal family relationships here. Uh, one of the things that we started noticing, and you can start seeing here based on sort of the keywords for genre and type of work um, and in this very colorful column, column is that while um, Oaks was working with famous playwrights and poets, um, we also see him publishing um, religious works or translations. Um, he is uh, really key to bringing in English translations uh, from the Italian of Ariosto's works. Um, he also brought in um, news from the continent in terms of collected uh, news sheets um, for the London public. So just going into the details of a figure like the publisher, Oaks, um, give us a way to see what kind of cultural shifts were happening in London in the early 17th century, and also what kind of um, news information the London public was receiving from the continent um, at the time. All right, so we have a large number of very big and complicated spreadsheets. So now what did we do with them? This is sort of the fun part, hopefully. Um, so let me give you a quick overview of three main methodologies that the students employed. Again, it's not everything. Look out for our website. Um, and then Sarah, uh, at the end, will drill in into the details of network analysis. So let me start um, very quickly uh, with network analysis. And I just wanted to um, point out um, sort of one of the, um, yes, this was the, um, uh, spreadsheets that the students um, worked with. Um, uh, here it is. Um, so <clears throat> once we started clearing up uh, some of these details, um, what the students are doing is to try to analyze these networks in details. And so most of this work was uh, preparing this data for um, the network visualization software, um, Gephi. Uh, another subgroup will work on creating, and is almost done, on creating a um, shiny app that also visualizes these networks uh, with some textual analysis work connected with it. Uh, but the vast majority of the work was using Gephi as a platform. Sarah will give you the details. Um, but uh, what it really made possible is to um, really connect publisher to printer to authors and trying to find 
sort of who are sort of the key network nodes of this period for publication of the most important theatrical works in London. Um, so in addition to that, uh, in sort of trying to get uh, the sense of the networks, we obviously wanted to um, think about the content of these works themselves. And this is where text, uh, textual analysis came in for us. Um, so as I mentioned at the beginning, um, this project is connected to a much longer interest and research that I've done with undergraduate and graduate students on textual analysis of early modern text. Um, so uh, one of the things that we wanted to do here is to build out of the methodologies for natural language processing of early modern text and trying to drill in on how to adapt what are really techniques designed for 20th and 21st century text um, to sort of the vagaries of uh, early modern English. Um, so some of the problems um, that we might encounter is that as any of you who might remember reading a Shakespeare play um, will probably sympathize with, um, early modern English is not standardized in spelling or syntax. Um, words often have different if related meanings uh, from the ones that we might currently use. And a sentence can often be very difficult to parse for readers of modern English and therefore for the methodologies uh, that have been developed for um, modern language uh, analysis. Um, so some of the questions that we might have, even before we get to what this slide is showing, some of the really complex questions of metaphorical language, is a word being used in its um, sort of everyday sense, or is it being used as part of a metaphor? Here I'm looking at the words poor and rich, which makes sense in a highly commercialized um, society. Um, do we mean being rich in as having a lot of funds, or do we being, being rich as a sermon might um, by using 2 Corinthians 8, for your sake he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Here clearly the word poor means poor financially, but rich means not wealthy financially, but spiritually or religiously rich. So um, this is sort of like a high level problem that might persist in contemporary English. But even before we get there, we have to deal with something as simple as are words spelled in a way that something like um, a topic modeling package in R or Python might recognize. Um, for our approaches, we really treated the text as collections of words. So a lot of our analysis was dependent on being able to correctly uh, count up how many times a text might mention um, a specific word. So to take an example, imagine I'm looking at two texts that are discussing art in some shape or form, like visual art. One of them might be thinking about landscapes more and the other one may be thinking about portraits. Well, to have a machine uh, learn to distinguish between the two, it probably will approach it by counting how many times one of them mentioned landscapes and how many times the other text will mention portraits. Well, early modern English makes this quite difficult. Um, portrait may be spelled the way we spell it now, or it might have a Y, or it might have a V, or it might have an extra R where you don't expect it. Um, so that means that a simple counting of how many times a text is mentioning a portrait or the word portrait uh, might really give us some trouble. Um, so in general, one of the things that I wanted uh, to point out is that the students um, did try to work in a very uh, sort of inventive way, as in the example here between poor and rich, to know that a word means something, we often didn't look at the word itself, but we might look at something that came um, like in sermons in the margins of the text would be the biblical reference. 
giving us a hint that here poor is being used literally in terms of wealth and money, and rich here is being used um, in a much more metaphorical sense. So we just had to be clever throughout on how to apply um, the standard natural language process and approaches. All right, um, finally, um, before I turn to Sarah, the last uh, approach that students did was to use all that um, wealth of information that we gathered about location to try to figure out if we could spot sort of the center of gravity of publication and book selling in London. Some of it is already well known um, even before our project. Um, it's fairly well known that the work, the places around St. Paul's Cathedral and its churchyard uh, were really the hub of the book trade of London in this period. Um, but a subgroup of students wanted to figure out if we could find other sort of neighborhoods understood not geographically in the strict sense, but sort of by um, sort of clustering of um, printers and publishers. Um, throughout London. What they had to do was to collect the very vague locations we had, cross-reference them from the Agus map to a modern map of London, find uh, longitude and latitude, map it onto London, and then um, use k-mean cl clustering, uh, trying to come up with this fantastic map. And by the way, the code for this map as for the other work um, is organized in GitHub repositories that are linked below this um, uh, video. But um, they gathered all this information and finally found three main um, sort of neighborhoods for the printing of London. Um, so we have found a way to reconstruct uh, what a London that has really um, disappeared in part because in 1666, a third of all of its building went burned in what is known as that Great Fire of London. And of course, just uh, four centuries have passed since um, this uh, people lived and published and sold and bought books in London. They were able to, the students were able to sort of bring this uh, world back to life. All right, I have spoken for way too long and I have not given Sarah a chance to discuss uh, the networks that her uh, group uh, came up with. So I think we'll shift to her screen and her work. Yes, so um, if you look at my screen right now, what I have open is Gephi. Uh, Gephi, as Dr. Jeannie mentioned, is a data visualization program. It's a Java program. It was created in about 2009, so it may look a little bit dated, but it is functionally the best thing we still have for this kind of work. So what graph analysis, or social network analysis rather, centers upon is this idea of nodes and edges, which if I show you at the data laboratory in Gephi, you can see that there's this edges spreadsheet and then there's also this node spreadsheet. So a node would refer to like a person, a place, or a thing that you're trying to identify, whereas an edge would be a connection between two different nodes. So when I shift back into overview, you can see these little dots all represent nodes, in this case people who are a range of publishers, printers, authors, preachers, or booksellers, and then they're connected to each other, of course, by those edges. So in terms of making decisions along the way, it took a lot of work to even get to be able to do this kind of analysis in the first place is number one, if you see all these names here under like the label section of the spreadsheet, is language itself was not standardized, nor were spellings of people's names, which you would think is a bit odd because wouldn't someone know how to spell their name? Not always the case, as she showed you with Oaks versus Oaks, there was an A in one of them, whereas the A was missing in another, is first and foremost, before we could even like piece together who was publishing with who, we needed to make sure that one, this person in this context was referring to this other person because the spelling was a bit off. Sometimes people just leave their initials as like SS was um, a very famous printer, Simon Stafford, and Ebo had attribution to his name, but we had to dig through those records and sort of re-verify based off of who else he had published with was this consistent with who he knew in the network. And then also sometimes there would be married couples that mm -hmm. we had to worry about, such as um, Edward and Elizabeth Aldi were a set of printers, and then sometimes we come across a work that says E. Aldi, and we have no idea who it is, but as long as we link those two people in the network, we can sort of understand that they're interconnected in some way, whether it be the husband or the wife. So first we had to standardize all of the names. And getting these names was a very long and arduous process that involved going through about 6,000 um, entries 
first on Evo, then putting them in a spreadsheet, and then finally being able to boil them down to publisher, author, printer, connecting those three people, and then plugging them into Gethy. So that was quite uh, an arduous process. That took about, I think, six, maybe seven weeks to even get to the point where we could put this into Gethy. Then we also have to worry about how are people connected and how are we going to sort of weight or show their interconnectivity is that printers and publishers were likely to know each other because the publisher would go to the printer and say, I want this many copies on this day and this will be its publication date. Whereas the author may not necessarily know the printer. So we had to make a decision. Are we going to connect authors to printers, even though we don't know if this social relationship existed? And we made the decision to go ahead and do that just because we were trying to see if any correlations emerge between who is printing with who and that that depended on the author or not. And then even coming up with these names is we made the decision to go for the most famous sort of early modern writers from this period, except for Shakespeare. This, uh, I say the work we did is notably Shakespeare reverse is um, I think one of the next steps most of us listed was we need to incorporate Shakespeare in this network because he was the head honcho sort of what was going on at the time. Um, so we had to make a decision of what printers were we even looking at. And that was based off of the authors we chose, which was a collection of about 10, I think, very mm-hmm. famous early modern writers, but no Shakespeare. So, and then we had to attribute printer, publisher, author, bookseller, preacher, using Gephi. If I hop over to overview, you'll see these different colors sort of represent who these people were. And that can just sort of let us know who's publishing with who. And the, all these really big dots that you can see. Um, Most of them are authors except for Nathaniel Butter, and that's because the work that we did was sort of a mix between the Stationer's Register and Ebo. And as Dr. Jinyu mentioned, one of the problems with using the Stationer's Register as um, a historical source is that it doesn't often have the names of authors included in terms of who's publishing what. You'll be lucky if you maybe get a printer or an author every now and then, quite rare, but what you can usually have is the title of the work Mm -hmm. plus the publisher. And then with that information, you can go and cross-reference it with Ebo, hopefully it's in the database, and then you'll see who the actual author is, unless it's anonymous. In some cases, that happens, and maybe you can use R. Stilo for author attribution, but we did not do that this semester. Um, and you have to figure out sort of who was working with that publisher. So you have to backtrack many, many times and sort of re-verify things through the records as you're going. So the network you're looking at now is um, it's about 293 people total are represented in this network. Most of them are so small they're not even visible because they only published about maybe once or twice. And that's where we get into sort of the weight slash frequency of relationships is we wanted to understand how do we show that some relationships were more important than others. When we look at this network, as, as you can see, um, Francis Beaumont is right on top of John Fletcher, and there's this huge mm. sort of arrow between them. That's because they were listed as co-authors on nearly every work we analyzed in this process. And so when you see bigger arrows, the way we decided to measure interconnectivity, even though it may not necessarily be representative of how well people knew each other in real life, was based off of the frequency of collaborations they had. So if you had more collaborations with a person, we decided to weight it in Gephi so that it showed as a stronger relationship in the network. Um, I believe that is about all of like the overall logistics in terms of how social network analysis worked for this project. Is Again, many decisions had to be made along the way in terms of one, how are we standardizing things? Is this a fair relationship to represent? How can we represent this relationship? And sort of what does this reveal? And so the results of this, while preliminary, were quite cool is that you see all this like mess in the middle. That's actually the most meaningful part of this graph. It's not these big clusters of one-off people publishing with the most famous author. It's that we get to see the ways different people knew each other. And then we also started trying to tie that, of course, the clustering, trying to see where people were based. That ended, I think, in disaster is almost everyone publishes in St. Paul's and they don't specify at the sign of the tiger or the bull. Mm -hmm. Um, And you're sort of left with um, a lot of questions about what was going on. But the social network itself was, again, relayed back to everything else that was going on is that all three of these pieces, even though they're a bit disjoint and it sort of worked most optimally for students to sort of split off into groups of three or four to really focus on one area, they, of course, were all connected as we're trying to answer these larger historical questions of what did London look like, who knew each other, how is it, you know, who's competing with each other, do printers sort of toe that line between working with different publishers who are in competition, is that we're beginning to see the hints of a larger historical picture just by using these computational methods. And as I have one more note, is that 
using this data is obviously for any sort of meaningful computational analysis, what you need is a massive amount of data. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, most historical sources are locked behind microfilm. Even if you have a TCP, like the lovely ones on Ebo, there's a whole slew of problems that come along with that. So you really have to dig by hand before you can even clean the data before putting it in again. Thank you. Yeah, and I want to once again um, thank Sarah and Henry for being the first two students to start diving into this data. I cannot emphasize how much manual work they had to do at the beginning of the project. Um, so the last thing that I wanted to do before we open it up to questions, if there are any, is um, simply to say that one of the things that um, struck me from the results of the students is just how innovative some of the um, printers themselves, the publishers and printers themselves, were in bringing in new types of works to London. Um, we often tend to focus, and rightly so, as Sarah mentioned to the head honcho, like, <laughs> like Shakespeare um, or some of the other sort of people like Decker, whom you've heard mentioned quite a bit because it's such a productive, um, playwright of the period, sort of the very well-known, the surviving books of the canon. But um, it really some of these publishers who brought in news books or brought in different types of works that um, were clearly going through a number of editions. They would often work with several printers to continue the same title, um, maybe in translation from another language. Um, and as far as I can tell, this gives us a real insight into the kind of cultural shifts, the kind of changes in taste that the English, um, and in particular the London po reading public, um, was sort of experiencing in this time period. What do you think, Sarah? I think it is really revealing, is especially when we look at, number one, just I think a lot of like the preliminary historical research on this period has shown is that this was quite a small publishing industry at the time is that our research also corroborates that is that it's very interconnected and we see this sort of burgeoning commercial culture as we have the sort of birth of early capitalism but that's also reflected in the literature when we get into the text analysis as you were talking about poor versus rich but I remember one of the things that like puzzled us or sort of interested us the most was the use of credit mm -hmm. is it sort of was used originally in terms of reputation like to your credit um, in terms of like sort of social capital but then it became about actual financial capital as we start seeing it more and more used in text often associated with the royal exchange's location which is quite interesting given the clustering we were doing is that they're saying to your credit financially so we see that these cultural shifts are happening and they do have real effects in language that we can observe and corroborate with these computational methods. Yeah, and uh, to what Sarah was saying, um, I'll share one last visual from my um, screen. Is, and this is something that, as I said, is a, a screenshot from the Shiny app, which is still being um, sort of made um, live, it's, it's not quite there yet. Um, but one of the next steps that um, the project is thinking through is how to link um, the kind of network analysis that Sarah just went through in such lovely detail with some of the text analysis work that the students have done. Um, so here we're looking at authors, um, publishers, uh, and their works in connection with specific terms. So what I mean is this. So we can see how an author is linked to a publisher in terms of a network quite easily. Did they work together? Did this publisher produce something from this author? But another question is, um, do we see shifting language being brought over from one author to another and connected to specific networks of publishers and printers. Can we see how not just the language floats on the sort of medium of text, but how um, sort of conversation potentially or sort of sharing of different types of works through the same publisher and printer might influence usage from author to author. I think um, this is sort of maybe where we'll be moving um, as this project progresses over the next year or so. Um, but it's certainly something that I'm interested in seeing. Um, well, I think um, this is all we have for today. Thank you. Thank you.